For a time today, I would like to come before you with a particular thought or theme which is encompassed in just one word, and that word is unbelief. Unbelief. This is something that the believer in Messiah, those who are in the body of Messiah, should have no association with. This term should be like a four-letter word to us. It is something that is off limits to not believe. Unbelief. Unbelief is defined as the state or the quality of not believing and unwillingness to believe. It is disbelief. It is skepticism, especially in matters of doctrine or religious faith. The Strong's lexicon defines the word unbelief as unfaithfulness or faithlessness. Unfaithfulness in terms of a person betraying a trust or betraying the truth. It is also defined as a want of faith, that is, withholding belief in the divine power and the promises of God. Unbelief it is also defined as withholding belief in the divine mission of Messiah Yeshua. Unbelief can be defined as weakness of faith or having little faith which is another way of saying you don't have any faith unbelief is the absence of faith or another way of saying it is unbelief is the lack of trust you don't trust God nor do you have confidence in Yahweh our God. As I said, unbelief is something that should be an anathema to the people of God. Never should this term be used to describe the people of God, nor should it be associated with anything that we are part of. In an article entitled The Slippery Slide, to unbelief. A famous evangelist goes from hope to hopelessness. These authors of this particular article, they write, during a speaking trip to England, Professor John Rindo Short, chairman of the Creation Ministries International Australia, told a group of pastors that if they rejected a literal genesis in favor of evolutionary ideas or just uh, or, or even just millions of, of years that this would put them on a slippery slide of unbelief he goes on to say that if we reinterpret God's word in Genesis to fit man's fallible opinion then ultimately it would only be consistent to apply this same method of interpretation elsewhere even to Messiah's resurrection. In other words, Professor Short is trying to say that if we conclude based on the opinions of man that the days of creation occurred over millions of years and not according to the scriptural account that says that God created the earth in seven days, then being consistent, we must also apply this same reasoning to all of our scriptural interpretation, that including the Messiah's resurrection. If you cannot take God's word for what it says, and then you have to apply your own reasoning to it in reference to the, to the creation account, 
then you must also use that same reasoning in other aspects or in other interpretations of the scripture. Professor Short goes on to say, we see this slippery slide illustrated more and more in Western culture. For instance, he says a 1999 newspaper report stated a growing number of liberal Christians, if there even is such a thing, how can you be liberal and a believer at the same time? But that's another message for another time. But he goes on and says that a growing number of liberal Christians and scholars do not believe that Yeshua rose bodily from the dead. This idea of questioning scripture, not believing what it says literally, but applying one's own method of interpretation or reasoning to what God says. He's saying that this is a slippery slope that leads you to unbelief. Now what could, could be the cause of such a slide into unbelief in a matter so vital and central to the gospel as the resurrection, Professor Short says. He says, we suggest that one of the major reasons is that as people have compromised the book of Genesis with the idea that creation occurred over millions of years, increasing numbers have consistently applied the same method of interpretation to the rest of the Bible. In other words, what he is saying is, if the creation account in the book of Genesis is not to be taken as literal, then using the same method of interpretation, the resurrection account cannot be taken literal either. In other words, rising from the dead is, is not to be taken literal. It is to be seen in a different way. It is something that we cannot count upon. The writer of this article goes on to say, this has led to making the word of God a mere myth and undermining of its absolute authority. And eventually this often leads to rejection of the orthodox of scripture or the orthodox of the message of the scripture. When you compromise in one area of the scripture, when you challenge the authority of one aspect of the scripture, then all of scripture then lose its authoritative power. Are you following me? Now following is a very sad account of a life of a once prominent and successful evangelist who slide into unbelief and his rejection of faith in the Messiah. There was a man called Charles Templeton. He was a young man from Canada who was born in 1915. He was generally acknowledged to be the most versatile of the new young evangelists. Templeton soon rose to prominence even surpassing another dynamic young preacher by the name of Billy Graham. In 1946, he was listed among the best used of God by the National Association of, of Evangelicals. And as the pastor of the rapidly growing Avenue Road Church in Toronto, which he had started with only his family and a few friends, Templeton then nominated his good friend, Billy Graham, to be the field evangelist for the new ministry. Templeton, Graham, and a few others regularly spoke to thousands when he meant to Messiah both in America and in Europe. However, despite his popularity and seemingly success as an evangelist, all was not well with Reverend Templeton. The more he read, the more he found he was beginning to question the essentials of the faith because he could no longer believe God's word beginning with Genesis. In other words, he had trouble 
reconciling the Genesis account with what he termed to be proven science. He began to question how could the scriptures be true when God says that he created the world in seven days and, and science says that earth was formed over millions of years. This caused this great preacher to question the authority or the validity of God's word. In a conversation with Billy Graham concerning Templeton's desire to attend Princeton Theological Seminary, Reverend Templeton stated this, but Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a period of days a few thousand years ago, he said. It has evolved over millions of years. He says, it is not a matter of speculation, it's demonstrable fact. In other words, he was willing to believe what the scientist says based, I mean, over what God said in his word. Or when we begin to compromise God's word saying, oh, a day could mean, or a day could consist of millions of years. Hear me now. If God wanted to say that a day is a million years, then he would have said it. If God would have said that he took millions of years to create the earth, then there would be no disputing that I would stand here and say, God said that it took him millions of years to create the earth. But God didn't say that. God said that in six days, all creation was formed. And then on the seventh day, he rested. What do you believe? Reverend Templeton, as the story goes, he warned Billy Graham that it was intellectual suicide to not question the Bible and to go on preaching God's word as authoritative. Finally, however, the doubts about everything he stood for became too great and he decided to leave the ministry. Good. Good riddance to Mr. Templeton. Templeton's struggle affected others as well. As Templeton wrestled with the demonstrable facts of evolution which made it impossible for, for him to believe the biblical account of creation, he sought out his close friend, Billy Graham. Many people are not aware of this, but this caused Billy Graham as well to grapple with tough decisions or tough questions that shook the very roots of the faith he professed and preached daily. Namely, was the Bible completely true? There's video out there on YouTube. I, I suggest you Google it. And you will find Billy Graham saying things, preaching things contrary to what the scripture says. This all began when he was influenced. When he began to question the authority of scripture, to question the accounts, namely of creation. Once you get on that mountain, it becomes a slippery slope, and it will lead you to unbelief. Unbelief is simply doubting what Yahweh, our God, has said. Will you believe God, or will you believe man? God says one thing, man says another. 
God says that this is the way it is done or this is the way I've done it. And then science with his computers and his sliding graphs and his thick glasses and goggles and, and pocket protectors and briefcases and tablets and all the other microscopes, they say something else. And the question is, who do you or who will you believe? Because you're going to have to believe somebody, baby. You can't be neutral in this thing. Well, I'm neutral. I just, I just go with it. Who will you believe? Those who doubt simply don't believe as true what has been written in the word of God. There are just, these are just two examples of well-known preachers who have preached to and have influenced thousands of people who doubted what the scripture says to be true. Now don't think for a minute that these two individuals or these two preachers are the exception rather than the rule because they are not. Every single day or every single Shabbat or every, even every single Sunday, there are other preachers besides these two men that believe as they do and they don clergy robes. There are some preachers up there just preaching not because they believe this. There's preachers up there preaching because they believe that the offering box they do this not so much because they love God or love his word but it is an easy way to, for them to be supported and to make money and to and if you become real good at what you do you can get your own little private jet oh yeah you can get you a, a nice fancy car maybe even a limousine and have somebody drive you to and fro you can have hordes of people carrying your briefcases and, and your Bibles and things like, oh, yes, you can. Yeah. Everybody you see preaching this word, everybody you see on TV, everybody you see being heralded as the next great preacher or those who have been invited to the White House to be to, be, to, to lead a prayer breakfast or to be the counselor or the advisor of the president. All of them are not preaching because they believe this. And I don't want you to be deceived into believing that everybody who says they are something are truly that person because even the scripture says that Satan or Hasatan and even the demons clothe themselves in light pretending to be sheep depend, depend, or deceiving and, and, and um, I can't even think of the word I want to say deceiving and fooling others to believe that they are something other than they are not they are sheep in wolves clothing from the unknown preacher to the most famous TV evangelist these insidious or this insidious evil of not believing what is written in the scriptures is rampant. Unbelief like the deadly cancer that it is is also growing rapidly among the laity or the followers or the body of Messiah. It is not just in the pulpit. It is even in the very seats that you are sitting in. Unbelief doubting and challenging God's word is in the very hearts and minds of God's people as they raise their hands and wave and shout hallelujah. Many who claim to be believers are in name only. This is because of what they believe or should I say what they don't believe. There are those who only support those parts or aspects of the scriptures that they think is valid 
or what they believe to be true. The other parts they disregard or simply ignore. They say, well, I don't believe that part. Oh, well, I believe this part and I will hold to that. For example, the scripture teaches about the sanctity of life. But yet there are some believers, and this is sad, who support abortion. That includes abortion as a result of taking the morning after pill or because of incest or rape or the life of the mother they say is at risk. And because of these things, they say that it is right and permissible to abort, or should I use a correct term, to kill that innocent life that is growing within them. If I'm stepping on your toes, then good. I'm coming back to do the other foot. I ask you, is not the life of the unborn child just as valuable, just as precious as the mother's life? Why not attempt to save both? Does Yahweh give us the right to prefer one life over the other? I ask you. The scripture says about Yahweh, He makes alive and He kills. He is the creator, our creator. And from what I read, he has given no man the right or the authority to kill an innocent life. So why do we, so why do some of us take that authority upon ourselves? Now even the scripture says, giving you an example that Rachel died in childbirth after giving birth to Benjamin. I ask you, why did Yahweh allow for that baby to live? Wouldn't have been right to kill the unborn baby Benjamin to ensure that the mother Rachel lived. Now think about this for a moment. If the baby would have been aborted, that is Benjamin, there would have only been 11 tribes of Israel and not 12. And would that scenario have been the will of God concerning Israel? Why not? Rachel's more important than Benjamin. Why not just snuff out Benjamin's life and go with 11? 11 is a good round number. Why let the mama die? Why not let her live? Why do we need 12 tribes of Israel? Would Yahweh have approved of the midwives choking the life out of the baby Benjamin before he exited the birth canal? Or would he rather of them use a mechanical device to grind up Benjamin or the baby Benjamin to pieces while he was still in the womb to ensure that Rachel would have survived. Do you think God would have said that? It says, oh, no, no, don't, you don't, don't use your hands, midwives. Here, use this hanger. This is much more effective. I would rather, I would rather you annihilate and kill the baby Benjamin to save Rachel's life. Now listen. Isn't it natural for a parent to do everything in their power to ensure the, the life of your child? Most fathers, most mothers will give up their own lives to make sure that their child was protected. Fathers are, before they go to bed, they're locking the doors and locking the windows, making sure 
The house is secure to make sure that nobody will come into the house and harm any one of them. And if somebody by chance did break into the house, the first one up, the first one walking down the stairs is the father. And if there is no father, then it is the mother there to protect her child. Even animals protect their young. If you back up an animal in the corner, the mother will attack you so that her children will live. She will willingly give up her life to protect her child. But not so with the humans. Heck no. We find the nearest grinder and we start grinding. But this is even the attitude among those in the body of Messiah. They said, oh, if you've been raped, oh, if there is incest, you kill the baby. Oh, they say, if the mother's life is at risk, then you kill the baby. Did you know that there are many men and women who profess belief in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Messiah Yeshua who supports a woman's right to choose. And the biggest one is sitting there in our White House. He supports late-term abortions. How can this be? How can this... This is a total rebellion against the very word of God. Now, there are also many believers who believe that homosexuality is not morally wrong, but is acceptable to God. Many believe that homosexuals not only have the right to marry and be offered the same rights and privileges as heter heterosexual couples, but that they even have the right to adopt and raise children. Because the body of Messiah has devalued the Torah with his admonishments that homosexuality is an abomination to Yahweh and have only embraced the new covenant or the new testament which, said, which they say teaches tolerance and love. then their view of the scriptures is distorted. They support gay marriage, like that man in the White House who says that he is a quote-unquote Christian. But he's not the only one. It's the in thing now to say that homosexuality is an alternate lifestyle. And that it really doesn't matter as long it, 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 that, that who adopts a child. As long as that child, they say, is raised in a loving family. Is that love? Having two hairy men? Oh, good gracious, don't make me sick. <laughs> ah! Two hot, sweaty men? Oh, good gracious. Oh! And then from that precious child, heart and eyes and minds being inf infected with that mess. Two women raising a child. Somebody asked the child, who's your mama? She points to two of them. And now these days, there's probably three or four of them. That's mommy one, mommy two, mommy three. But we say that it is all right. We say that it is okay. People who believe such, these people who profess to be believers, their belief is distorted because they only believe a version or a part of God's word. 
And because they only believe a part of God's word, it is evidence that they, they, that they don't believe any of God's word. They say, well, that was the Old Testament. The New Testament is about love. That's what they say. They say the New Testament doesn't teach against homosexuality. God has a um, God was hard, but Yeshua is soft. He's different. To truly say that you believe in the scriptures is to believe all of it and all that it declares. If Yahweh said that He created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh then that is what you and I must believe. If you believe that God created the earth in millions of years, I would ask that you would readjust your thinking. Because men says that the, the layers of the earth and it took millions of years for those things to develop. The scripture says that Yahweh laid the foundations of the earth. And almighty God didn't take him millions of years. It's not like he put one grain of dirt and one grain of sand at a time. And he just all day just picking and putting dirt so he can get the layers going. The scripture says he laid the foundations. I would ask that you would readjust your thinking. If Yahweh said that homosexuality is wrong, then why are there homosexual churches today? How do I know they exist? Because a good friend of mine was part of one. Sad, ain't it? Why are there openly homosexuals Pastors leading congregations. Oh, they're out there. There's, I'm, not, I'm not talking about just Catholic church. I'm talking about Lutheran and all these other. You know what? There's some homosexual Pentecostal preachers too. Oh, I want to throw that out there to you. Bishop Eddie Long, who was a well known TV preacher this huge mega church he was accused of sending uh, photos of himself to young boys oh yeah he denied it said it didn't happen but guess what he settled out of court for millions of dollars <laughs> his wife divorced him these young boys got the pictures of, of the pastor doing a selfie in the mirror <laughs> I'm just trying to say the, the other well known guy the what's his name Haggard well, another well known TV preacher in a mega church he stepped down because it was, it was, it was found out that he's having relations with another man <laughs> guess what He's back in the pulpit. Says that, oh, he was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Okay. But all I'm saying is that this is rampant. You have these pastors, these leaders also engaging in homosexual activity. They're leading congregations at influencing others. And lastly, why are believers supporting these individuals' rights to exist? Homosexual churches, homosexual pastors. Why did part of the body of Messiah vote to reelect President Obama when they knew ahead of time he supported abortions and gay right marriage? If you knew this man supported it, what in the heck is part of the body of Messiah voting for that man? Oh, yeah. Folk in church screaming, shouting, 
speaking in tongues, rolling up the aisle, rolling down the aisle, laying hands on the sick, doing all kind of manner of spiritual gifts, they say. And was the first one at the voting booths, voting for Obama. Oh, I don't care. Oh, he's better than Romney. Oh, he's better than Romney. At least Romney did not support sodomy. You know what I mean. I'm just being gentle with that word. He did not support two women. I was I was riding in the I was riding in the van one day or ride, riding the car, going to Walmart. Turned down Tusk to go to Walmart, and I seen these t two women holding hands, walking down the street, wide open. And to put a and, and to make it really entertaining, I guess they thought I guess I'll just give them a smooch. So these two women walking down the street smooching. What in the world? <laughs> no shame, bro. Another time I was walking in, I was in Walmart walking, two women just holding him. Oh, good. And everybody just walking like, well, that's okay. That's just the way they are, just the way the world is. It's okay, you know. I'm not against that. We need more Phineas, who when he saw a violation against God's words, he picked up a spear and ran them both through. We need people who will stand up and say, get your hands off that woman, you woman, or he woman, wherever you think you are. It is not right for you to do what you are doing. But to me, I, I find it a shame. For people who say that they love God, but yet with their actions they prove otherwise. Like I said, voting for Obama who supports the killing of children. Who supports that men can be French kissing other men and women can be bedding other women. And then think it's okay. Now, there are other many examples of believers not believing in what the Scripture says as well. Take, for instance, the death penalty. The Scripture commands us to put to death those who commit murder. For the Scripture says in the book of Numbers, chapter 35, verse 30 to 31, if anyone kills someone, the murderer is to be put to death upon the testimony of witnesses. But the testimony only of, only of one witness would not suffice to cause a person to be put to death. Also, you are not to accept a ransom in lieu of the life of a murderer condemned to death. Rather, he must be put to death. God says, if you kill somebody, I don't care your age, you're going to die. That's the word of God. And then he goes, and then God says this, you are not to feel sorry for these people who have been condemned to death. You don't give them a life sentence without parole. They say, oh, that's crueler than the death penalty. Trust me, baby. There's nothing crueler than death. Because once you're gone, we don't got to see you no more. Don't got to feed you no more. Don't got to clothe you no more. Don't got to hear you filing silly lawsuits anymore. Or to say that, I've been reformed. Very may well, well, maybe. But you're supposed to be dead. That's justice. That's what the word of God says. That's justice. But there are believers, or could I say many believers in Messiah who are opposed to the death penalty because they say that it is cruel and that no man or woman has a right to take another person's life. That's not true because God gave us the authority. They, God says in the book of Genesis chapter 9, if a person takes another person's life, then by a man shall his life be taken. God has given us the authority to put all murderers deep in the ground. Then 
these people who are soft hearted these people who don't believe what God's word says or believe that they know better than God they go even so far as to say of those who believe in the death penalty that we are no better than the murderers <laughs> that's what they say who's right is God right or are you right but I do believe the scripture says let God be true and every man a liar who's right we want to just put people in jail forever and don't got to worry about them ever get out on parole that's why our jails are so overcrowded start killing folk you have plenty of room <laughs> I know that may sound harsh that may sound harsh, but listen, I have no compassion for another person who takes another person's life. The scripture tells me, do not feel sorry for them who have been condemned to death. I don't want to hear their stories about how their daddy mistreated them or the mama didn't pet them on the head at night before they went to bed. That did not cause them to commit murder years and years and years later. They had a choice. I don't care about your psychology or, or the psychologist comes in and says, oh, they're not able to stand trial because at the time that they murdered somebody, they wasn't thinking clearly. I can fix that. When I put them to death, I won't be thinking clearly either. So then you can't fault me from doing what is right. These people, their belief, who believe that the death penalty is wrong, they are, they are in actually, their belief is actually rebellion against the word and the will of God, which is truly unbelief. You see, it's that slippery slope. When you began to question God in one aspect, you began to question him in many other things. It's a slippery slope. If God said it, then we must believe it. The list goes on and on of believers not obeying and believing in what Yahweh has written in his word. From parents not believing in spanking an unruly child to not believing in paying tithes. From wives not obeying and being submissive to their husbands to husbands not loving and treating their wives with respect and honor. The scripture tells us to do all these things, but we, on the other hand, think we know best, and so we don't. Many of us bought into that theory that spanking and discipline in our child is wrong. Shoot. Our children smart off at the mouth and tell moms and dads the, where to go and then how to go at it. Let a child tell me where to go. I'll send them their first class ticket. I just, I, 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 I don't like this really this, this children. That's why uh, Alana, she's at that, that, that age too now where she, she wants to exert herself and having me to dust off my own exertion. I have to have to get my daughter in line many a times. I raise my voice and say, get over here like I told you. She comes running, whoa. We must discipline and do what the scripture says. There are some people who challenge the word of God from believers dating and marrying unbelievers to believers committing adultery and fornication from saved children being disrespectful to parents to believers hating each other and then plotting each other's demise. From believers lying and deceiving each other to preachers not preaching and teaching the truth but only saying those things that they believe that the people want to hear. From believers hating Israel and you got them out there. Don't you know that there's churches out there actively boycotting against Israel? 
because they think Israel is cruel to the Palestinians. Believers hating Israel to others even denying the divinity of Messiah Yeshua. Unbelief, whether one chooses to admit it or not, is rampant inside the believing community of God. This is a direct fulfillment of the scriptures which says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, for the day will not come until after the apostasy that is a, a great falling away or a defection from the truth has come and the man who separates himself from Torah has been revealed, the one destined for doom. The scripture says that the coming of the Lord and the revealing of the anti-Messiah won't happen until there has been a great falling away or a defection from the truth. That is, they're no longer believing in what the scripture says. They're challenging God's authority or challenging what the scripture says. This is not um, by unbelievers who are doing this. These are people in the body of Messiah who are challenging the scriptures. He says there will be a great falling away. A great defection. That day, that defection, brothers and sisters, has already come. Many who claim to believe no longer believe or adhere to the truth of scriptures. For the most part, they only believe what they want to believe. Oh, they will tell you that they believe everything written in the scriptures. Oh, the scripture is the ultimate and the final authority, they say. That they believe in the totality of the word of God. But how they choose to live their lives, what issues, what policies, and what candidates they support truly tells the whole story. It tells Yahweh all he needs to know about them, about what they believe, or whether they truly believe him or not. I'm almost done. Of these people, Yeshua said this in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? And then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. Lawless means that they did not obey the word of God. Because people who profess faith in Messiah Yeshua don't truly believe they naturally don't do what Yahweh says in his word. This confirms Yeshua's statement when he says, only those who do what my father wants in heavens will enter the kingdom of God. Only those who do, not those who profess. Only those who do what my father wants what he says in his word, what he has declared in his scriptures will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And those who support gay marriage, you ain't getting in, so sorry. And those who support abortion in any form are not getting in. So sorry. 
I don't care if you have the gifts of laying on of hands. What does that mean? I don't care if you was used to raise the dead. Irrelevant. I don't care if you call fire down from heaven and cause for people to see this great miracle and as a result, thousands were saved. Meaningless. Unless you do what God says, unless you believe what he says, Yeshua says in all your work is for naught because he will say at the end of the day, I never knew you. Unbelief has consequences. Unbelief has adverse side effects. Unbelief causes one to disobey God. Unbelief is disobedience to the word of God, which is sin. Sin causes Yahweh to not only reject us, but he rejects everything then that we do. And that includes our offerings of whatever type, our acts of kindness, no matter what they may do or be. No matter how much you give to the poor, no matter if you even give your life, as the Apostle Paul says, to be burned. It means nothing if we don't live according to God's standards, his word, and believe what he says. When we reject Yahweh, when we reject his word, when we reject what he says for us to do, and we say, no, we won't do it like that. The scripture says, then he will in turn reject us. For the scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 through 23, does Yahweh take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Yahweh says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice and heeding orders than the fat of ram. For rebellion is like the sin of sorcery or witchcraft. Stubbornness like the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he too has rejected you. There are many believers in the body of Messiah or who claim to be believers whom Yahweh has already rejected already like I said how can you say when God says this is true and then you say well no that that's really not what he said or that's really not what he meant this is true if God says homosexuality is wrong and no matter what form it's wrong it's wrong I don't care if the, the, the Congress and the Supreme Court or Obama says it's right, it's wrong. And we should not support it. We should not give our dollars towards it. Abortion is wrong. We should not support it. For those who say discipline in our children is wrong, you're walking a very thin line because God says, don't spare the rod. If God says it's right, then it's right. If God says that a believer should not hook themselves up with and be engaged in with unbelievers, that's what he meant. He didn't say, oh, well, well, you know, you could change him. Give him a try. You can change him. You can make him better. You can fluff him up. You can dress him up and... That's not what he says. Come out from among them, my people, and be separate. What does light have to do with darkness or the altar of Yahweh with the altar of Baal? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Separate yourselves, he said.
Don't you know that after the Babylonian captivity, the people of Israel, God allowed for them to go home and to build the, the, the second temple. And Ezra was right there with them, leading them and helping them and instructing them. But then when Ezra came to Jerusalem, he saw something that broke his very heart. He saw the people of, of Judah marrying and being engaged with unbelieving women. These men were taking these women to themselves, having children with them. These pagan, these heathen women. And it broke Ezra's heart. The scripture says he ripped his clothes, put on sackcloth, and sat down in the street and cried. Because Israel was just in, in captivity, in slavery, in exile because they were sinning against the word of God. And here they are all over again after God freed them. They're doing the same mess again. People saw Ezra sitting there weeping and crying, ripping his hair out. Because this man loved Yahweh, loved his word, and he loved his people. And then the people came to him and said, well, we're sorry for what we've done. He says, what should we do? Do you know that the people put away their pagan wives and sent them and their children away? And do you know that this was not only acceptable to Ezra, but it was acceptable to Yahweh as well. And then these individuals who did so, then now have the right to be married to people of like faith. But if they would have persisted in their marriage, in their relationship with these people, don't you know that God would have just cut them off? Why? Because they were defying the very word of God. God says, don't do something, and when you in turn do it anyway. If we persist in not believing what the word of God tells us to do with how are we to live our lives day by day and how we are to treat one another, then we too will miss out on seeing and experiencing the power of Yahweh as he is fighting to deliver us from all of our troubles. Unbelief will cause for our troubles and sufferings to continue. Like our ancestors who lost out on entering the land, land of promise, because they chose not to believe in the promises of Yahweh, he told them that in spite of the giants living in the land, that he would defeat them, that he would drive them out, and that he would give the land to the children of Israel. But because they did not believe God, they did not inherit these promises. In closing, I admonish you not to be like our ancestors, don't lose out on what Yahweh has promised you and I through unbelief. Don't you know that if we persist in not believing what the word of God says and how it tells us to live, then we too will miss out on being blessed and then entering into eternity. The side effects of unbelief is a complete separation from God and the blessings that flow from him. I leave with you this scripture, and it says from the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 16, through chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Who were the people who, after they heard, quarreled so bitterly? All those whom Moshe brought out of Egypt, and with whom was God disgusted for 40 years? Those who sinned, yes, they fell dead in the wilderness. And to whom was it that he swore 
that they would not enter his rest, those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, let us who are alive today be terrified of the possibility that even though the promise of entering his rest remains, any one of you might be judged to have fallen short of it because of your unbelief in what God says in his word. If God said it, you must believe it, no matter how impossible it may sound. If God said the earth was made in, in seven days, then you reject the notion that men say that it was made over millions of years. You did not evolve from a monkey. If you believe you do, we have a plenty of bananas in the back for you. There was a van waiting outside to take you to the nearest zoo so you can visit your family. If that's what you believe, and I want to help you, but the scripture doesn't say that. It says, I, you and I were created in the image of the one. Don't let man deceive you with his science. I'm not saying science is bad. I'm not saying science is wrong. But when science contradicts, stands against the very word of God, then you must reject science. If God says something, then that's true. Then you hold on to it, baby. Even if it makes you at, at odds with the rest of the world. If God says that the land of Israel belongs only to Israel, then the Palestinians have no right to live there. They have no right to a grain of sand there. Do you understand what I'm saying? If God says it is the people of Israel's land forever, then the Palestinians got to go. They have to leave. Because they themselves are violating the very word of God. They know what the scripture says. And you can't support any boycott against Israel. You can't support any speech, any dialogue, any written word that condemns Israel. God says, I will bless those who bless her. And I will curse those who curse her. We must watch ourselves. Israel is a land that Yahweh loves. Be careful. Don't let your unbelief or don't let your belief in things other than what the scripture says cause you to miss out on what our God has for us. 